Hello and welcome to section three of our video lecture on the digestive system. In this video, we are going to discuss the mouth, pharynx, and esophagus. So here we have the mouth and our oral cavity, which is also known as the buccal cavity. And it is going to include the cheeks, the tongue, and our palate. We see that it's bounded by our lips, which we call labia anteriorly and it opens up into the pharynx posteriorly over here. In this area, we'll see that the tissue is lined with our moist stratified squamous epithelium. Again, we have an area of abrasion where the food is gonna come into. And then the roof of the oral cavity is made up of the palate. So here we see the hard palate, which is going to be made up of the maxilla and the palatine bone. And behind that, we have the soft palate. Here, it's made up of skeletal muscle and connective tissue. And this ball that hangs in the back of your throat is known as the uvula. We've talked about before how it swings back so that it can protect the nasopharynx from the food and fluid that we eat and ensures that that moves down into the oropharynx and then into the laryngopharynx and into the esophagus. So here is an actual oral cavity and just wanted to show you the hard palate here, soft palate, and there's that uvula. And just a sagittal view as well of our hard palate, again made of the maxilla and palatine bone, the soft palate and the uvula hanging back. So it can swing on up and block the nasopharynx. We also have this fold known as the labial frenulum. We've got a superior one and an inferior one attached to the lower lips here. And this is made up of a mucous membrane that is just gonna attach to that inner surface of each of the lip to the, that should say gum, not gem. <laughs> and then if we look at the musculature within this area, we see our buccinator muscle here. This is really gonna help with the sucking motion, or if you play a windpipe instrument, you'll utilize this muscle a lot. And we also have the orbicularis oris here. This is a circular muscle that surrounds the lips and will allow us to do that, um, that puckering up kissy face um, when the muscle contracts. And so these muscles can function together to also help us in speaking and keeping the food within our mouth. Next, we've got the tongue here. This is going to be a very muscular organ and it is going to have a free anterior surface and is attached posteriorly. As we said before, it is going to be covered with moist stratified squamous epithelium and the tongue itself has intrinsic muscles within it that will help it change shape. So if you're able to fold your tongue, those are intrinsic muscles at work, whereas extrinsic muscles could be attaching to areas of the neck or the chin area that is going to allow your tongue to protrude and retract. So essentially sticking your tongue out and moving it back and also moving your tongue from side to side. Now we also do have something called a lingual frenulum. If you lift your tongue up, that is going to be the mucus connection between your tongue and the floor of the oral cavity. Now if we look at this anterior surface here, we can see some structures called papilla and the papilla are going to have well most of them are going to have taste buds within them to allow us to have that sensation of something sweet something sour and so forth so posteriorly we don't have any papilla just a few scattered taste buds and we also have our lingual tonsil here the lingual tonsil is made up of lymphoid tissue and serves as a surveillance area of pathogens moving into the gi tract as the food is going to move into our mouth we can move our tongue around to help with that mastication. Our tongue is also going to participate in speech and swallowing. One of the accessory glands within our oral cavity are the salivary glands. <clears throat> We've got three pairs of them, the largest one being the parotid over here. 
in our parotid uh, gland, you could see in this cadaveric image here as well, could be found anterior to the ear and external to this muscle known as the masseter muscle that attaches to our mandible. The parotid gland has this special duct for itself called the parotid duct that will open into our oral vestibule next to the second upper molar. And the fluid that it's going to secrete is mostly serous. Now our other salivary gland is the sub, let's move to the submandibular gland and do this in order. So our submandibular gland is pretty large as well, not as large as the parotid, but it could be found medial to the body of our mandible, which you see well depicted over here, even though the mandible has been cut out of the way. And its duct is going to be at the base of the lingual frenulum, and its fluid is a mix of serous and mucous fluid. Then we've got our sublingual gland, which you see pictured here and here, and this is anterior to our submandibular gland under the tongue. Now, especially within this picture, you could see that it has many ducts, about 10 to 12, that open up into the floor of the mouth. So this is the gland that maybe if you think of something sour, you'll start to get saliva pool at the bottom of your tongue. And this is gonna be a mix of serous and mucous fluid, although it's primarily mucus. So you could see amongst these three salivary glands that we really have a widespread on the type of fluid each secrete. Now our saliva is made up of 98 to 99.5% water. And we will also have glycoproteins, enzymes, growth factors, and waste products within it. One of the important immune factors we have in there is IgA. So this is a immunoglobulin A, which is a antibody, and it helps prevent bacterial infection. The saliva will also provide lubrication so that we're not damaging the tissue within our oral cavity and will help to kind of pull the food together and we will have secretion of salivary amylase to break down the starch and like i said the mucus portion especially will help to form the bolus and putting all of those food particles together so that we can swallow it and lastly we have the parasympathetic input that causes that salivary production now, sometimes those glands can get infected, and in this case, it is the parotid gland causing mumps. This is when we have an infection that could be caused from the nasal passages and the pharynx by a virus, specifically the paramyxovirus, and can cause an enlargement and inflammation of that parotid gland, forming a bump in the mandibular and neck region. Symptoms are typically fever and throat pain, and luckily we do have a vaccine for this so that we can reduce the incidence dramatically. And here is the statistics that we could see from when that vaccine was introduced and the reduction within the incidence of people suffering from mumps. Next, let's talk about the teeth. These are used to mechanically break down our food, and we do have two sets within our lifetime. First, we have our primary or decidu deciduous or milk teeth that we have within our childhood, and we have 20 altogether. And then we lose those and get our permanent or secondary adult teeth, in which we will have 32 altogether. Now, if we break down the type of teeth that we have, we have our incisors, the canines, which are the sharp looking like teeth, our premolars, and then our molars in the back. So let's take a look at an individual tooth and what the anatomy looks like there. First, we'll show the gingiva, which are the gums, and these are just made up of some soft tissues that line the alveolar processes of our maxilla and the mandibles, and will help surround the area that we call the neck, where it's a bit constricted. The anatomical crown we could see over here is that enamel covered portion of the tooth. And then we also have the clinical crown that's the section of the tooth above the gum line. So all of this area here. And then we have the neck that we described earlier, just where we see that constriction below the gum line. 
if we look at the layers of the teeth, we could see that enamel is the outermost layer. And as a part of that anatomical crown, this is non-living tissue and is acellular, but serves as a really important protective factor to the rest of the structure of the tooth. Below the enamel, we have the dentin depicted in blue here. This is living and cellular and is made up of calcified tissue. We can see that it extends down into the root of the tooth and is covered by cellular bone like structures that help hold that tooth in its socket. And this joint, remember, was the gomphosis joint. And then we've got our pulp cavity, which is in this area here. You could see it's filled with these blood vessels and nerves. Of course, we have these on both sides, but they've depicted them separately. So you could see the full scale of it and surrounding it would be connective tissue. And lastly, we'll mention the periodontal ligaments, which are these bands over here. These help to hold the tooth in the socket. So as you can imagine, when we have our deciduous or milk or childhood teeth, we are going to start to break these ligaments in order for that tooth to move out of its socket. Next, let's move into the pharynx. This is going to be involved in both digestion and respiration. So we'll have both food, fluid, and air moving through this area. It is lined with skeletal muscle with a mucous membrane covering, and we divide it into three different areas. We've got our nasopharynx that is found posterior to the nasal cavity, our oropharynx found posterior to the oral cavity, and then our laryngopharynx that is posterior to the larynx. And this does serve as the inferior border of the laryngopharynx that will then um, connect to the esophagus. And of course, the anterior portion of that laryngopharynx is attached to the larynx. So if we were to inhale air, it would move into the larynx and then into the trachea. If we are consuming food and fluid, it is going to move down and back into the esophagus. And here's just a view of that bolus moving from the pharynx down into the esophagus. So here's the oral cavity. We see that epiglottis move down to protect the larynx, and it moves further into the esophagus here. That brings us to the esophagus, which is approximately 30 centimeters long and could be found posterior to the trachea. We could see that well demonstrated in this photo here where the trachea would be lying anteriorly here, and this is all of the esophagus. And we are going to then see the esophagus pass through the diaphragm in an area known as the esophageal hiatus. So basically it means that there's an opening within the diaphragm so that we can transition that esophagus from the thoracic region here in, through the diaphragm <clears throat> and into the abdomen for it to connect to the stomach. Now sometimes we get a widening of that opening that hiatus and the esophagus along with the stomach can move into the thorax. So that is called a hiatal hernia in which that hiatus opens up, allowing some of the organs from the abdomen to move into the thorax. Our esophagus has two different sphincters. <clears throat> we have the upper esophageal sphincter, which is made up of striated muscle. And then we have our lower esophageal sphincter, which has many names. It's also known as the cardiac sphincter and the lower gastroesophageal sphincter, or just the, um, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter itself, and is made up of smooth muscle. So we do not have control of the sphincter. It is involuntary. And through the esophagus, we saw how peristalsis helped move the bolus down through the esophagus, and eventually will allow it to move into the stomach. So going back to that animation, we could see that bolus moving down through that lower esophageal sphincter. Now let's look at deglutination, which is just a fancy word meaning swallowing. So we've got the movement of the food from the oral cavity, the mouth, to the stomach, which takes about four to eight seconds for a solid or semi-solid 
type of food and one second for a very soft food or any liquids that we that we um, intake. So we've got three stages for deglutination. First is that voluntary phase in which the bolus is within the oral cavity and we are swallowing it back. <clears throat> then we have our pharyngeal phase and this is now when the autonomic nervous system takes over and we allow those constrictor muscles to move the food down the pharynx and moves us into the third phase, which is the esophageal phase. And again, the autonomic nervous system will take over, allowing the muscles within the esophagus to constrict and create paracelsus movement down the esophagus. And I highly suggest for you to click on this animation of deglutination so that you could see the process in um, more of a sequential type of step to see that food moving down into the stomach.